In the previous video, we talked about the first two parts in the chapter, the types of people that exist, and the story of Adam, peace be upon him. In this video, we'll take a look at the children of Israel, the story of Abraham, and Islam as a way of life. So who are the children of Israel? The word Israel is a Hebrew word that means servant of God. Israel was also another name for Yaqub, or Jacob, who was a prophet. He was also the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. Jacob had 12 sons, and from them came 12 different tribes that formed a vast nation of people known as Benu Israel, or the children of Israel. So why are they mentioned here in this chapter? We learn from the story of Adam that God honored Adam and Hawa by making them the first human beings created and placing them in heaven. Yet they still sinned and disobeyed God when they ate from the forbidden tree, which led to their departure from heaven and placement on earth. However, they recognized their sin and asked God for forgiveness, and He forgave them, and they continued on the straight path as believers. Iblis, on the other hand, was arrogant and disobeyed God's commandment to bow to Adam. He refused to recognize his sin, which led him to go astray and was no longer a believer. The children of Israel are mentioned here as an example of an important nation that God favored and blessed throughout their history. Yet many of them failed to submit themselves to God and follow his commandments, similar to Iblis. The chapter goes on to mention many of the blessings they received from God, particularly during the time of Moses, peace be upon him. Like when God saved them from Pharaoh and his people, who killed their sons and kept their women. And how God parted the sea to rescue them and drowned Pharaoh and his people right before their eyes. And how God forgave them for worshiping the calf after Moses left them for 40 nights. And how God gave them the scripture, the Torah, to help them distinguish between right and wrong and help guide them to the straight path. And when God shaded them with clouds and sent down food for them when they were hungry and lost in the desert. And when God commanded Moses to strike the rock with his staff and 12 springs gushed out, one for each of their 12 tribes. And when God raised the mountain above them, telling them to hold firmly to the scripture he gave them and observe its teachings so they would be mindful of God. All these blessings and miracles Yet many of them were ungrateful and continued to reject God's signs. Their belief in God wavered, and they no longer feared the Day of Judgment. This was a recurring theme not only with Moses, but with many of the prophets that came after him. Their example is meant to serve as a warning to Muslims, not to be arrogant and misguided, and not to fall off the straight path as they did. The chapter then presents the example of Abraham, who's considered the father of all prophets and the patriarch of the children of Israel. Unlike them, he completely submitted himself to the will of God and followed his guidance. God tested Abraham in so many difficult ways, yet each time he succeeded in fulfilling God's commandments. One of the early examples of these tests was when he challenged his father and his entire community and called on them to stop worshiping idols and to worship their creator, Allah, the one and only God. As a result of his message, he was captured and thrown into a large fire, but God blessed him and saved him from the fire and he came out unharmed. Another major test he faced was later in his life, when God ordered him to take his wife Hajar and their newborn son Ismail and leave them in an arid valley in the Arabian Peninsula alone with no food and water. As difficult as that was, he accepted God's plan, and God took care of Hajar and Ismail. This valley would later become Mecca. Abraham would be tested again years later, when God ordered him to go back to his family in Mecca and to sacrifice his son Ismail. When he told Ismail of God's command, Ismail accepted his fate with no hesitation. As a result of their faith in God and their willingness to follow his order, God blessed them both and rewarded them 
by placing a ram there to sacrifice instead. This was yet another difficult test from God that Abraham passed successfully. God then informs him that he will make him into a role model and an example for people to follow. Years later, Abraham and Ishmael would go on to build the Kaaba in Mecca, which was the first house of God. Abraham would then make a prayer. Our Lord, raise from among them a messenger who will recite to them your revelations, teach them the book and wisdom, and purify them. Indeed, you alone are the Almighty, all-wise. Generations later, God would answer his prayer by choosing Muhammad, who was born in Mecca to be the final messenger and prophet of God. Abraham's legacy and example would continue on through the lives of his sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and his grandson Jacob, peace be upon them. So now that we've talked about the children of Israel and the story of Abraham, we now come to the final part of this chapter and that is Islam as a way of life. In this part, we learn about the laws prescribed by God, which help guide us to the straight path. These laws affect us on an individual, family, and societal level. On an individual level, we learn about the five pillars of Islam. The Shahada, belief that there is only one God, establishing prayer, giving charity, fasting the month of Ramadan, and performing Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. We also learn about the articles of faith in Islam, such as belief in Allah, belief in the Day of Judgment, belief in the angels, belief in the scriptures, and belief in all the prophets that came before us. This is a spiritual shift that takes us back to the religion of Abraham and his children, and their descendants, Moses and Jesus, all of whom were Muslim, which simply means one who submits to Allah. There's also a physical shift mentioned here, the change of the Qibla, which is the direction Muslims face during prayer. The direction of the Qibla is changed from Jerusalem to Mecca, which is the original Qibla during the time of Abraham. The chapter goes on to talk about the laws that forbid us from eating certain types of food, as well as intoxicants and gambling. On a family level, there are laws that deal with marriage, divorce, and wills. It provides guidance around giving charity and prioritizing who we give it to. On a societal level, there are laws about contracts, business, and finance. Laws that deal with crimes such as murder and the importance of establishing justice. Rules on how to engage an enemy in warfare. When is war justified and against whom? These laws establish Islam as a way of life and shows us what a Muslim society should look like. They help guide us to the straight path and prevent us from going astray. God is testing us the same way he tested Adam and Hawa, the children of Israel and Abraham. The chapter ends with a prayer, asking God to forgive us and guide us to the straight path. Our Lord, do not punish us if we forget or make a mistake. Our Lord, do not place a burden on us like the one you placed on those before us. Our Lord, do not burden us with what we cannot bear. Pardon us, forgive us, and have mercy on us. You are our only guardian, so grant us victory over the disbelieving people. Help us create more videos by visiting our website today and contributing to our mission and project. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel to access more videos and content.